Hi, I'm Mary Ellen Copeland, and I'm with the Green Mountain Conservancy, and I want to talk to you this afternoon about the Deer Run Nature Preserve. Normally, be holding an informational meeting so you all could come out and hear about this important project. Given the circumstances right now, I've decided to make a video. Roger Haydock is going to be coming on toward the end of the video and he'll take you on a short walk up phase one of the property to describe some of the geologic features. The Deer Run Nature Preserve is a project of the Green Mountain Conservancy. And what we do is we acquire and protect forest land in southern Vermont. There are industrial uses for land and there are coming to be less and less large tracts of forest lands available. And so we want to acquire and protect forest land so that they're available into the future to ensure their natural character and continued biodiversity. Uh, this is an elf cup fungi in this picture. There are multiple organisms, many, many, many more than we can even think of, that live in our soils, um, live on top of our soils. Um, and then we have our plants, and then we have animals from deer, uh, bear, porcupine, beaver, all kinds of animals uh, that really depend on these large tracts of land to keep them going. We want to conserve wildlife corridors and watersheds from the Connecticut River Valley all the way across to the Green Mountain National Forest. We've learned over time that this is one of the corridors where animals need to be able to move back and forth freely. Scientists around the world are understanding the importance of the protection and preservation of these corridors for resilience against climate change. So we're part of networks kind of around the world who are doing this important work. When you walk in our forest, you'll see that they're messy. And you may say, this is a preserve, why aren't they cleaning it up? And we're not gonna clean it up because those down trees and all of that refuse on the forest floor and the trees that are of multiple uh, ages are very important to sequester carbon. Um, that carbon is, is, is a problem at this time of climate change. And this kind of forest sequesters that carbon and makes it uh, less of a problem and makes it much more interesting forest to walk in. The animals love it. You'll find uh, chipmunks and squirrels and snakes and amphibians, all kinds of wildlife on the forest floor. Uh, we are doing it so that there's a place where people can go to learn and understand and appreciate and steward these important lands. This is a group that was hiking on the land a few weeks ago to identify various species during the school year. And even more so, we understand this year, there is a wilderness school close by that, that meets and the young people that come to the wilderness school use these lands, they hike on them, and they have educational programs on the land and help us to steward the land. We do it to protect their aesthetic and inspirational values and to improve the quality of life for residents and visitors to Southern Vermont. Very important. So who are the key people that are doing this? And this is Cindy Levine, Jennifer Ambler, Ed Anthes, Alex Wilson, Patty Smith, Dan Doobie, Roger Haydock, Sam Farwell, and myself, Mary Ellen Copeland. We're the board of directors, but more important than that are people from the community. Uh, right now, as I'm doing this program, there's a, a group of young people that are out on the land, not far from where we are, and they are removing invasive buckthorn. That invasive buckthorn gets in the way of the growth in this wetland area where they're working, gets in the way of the growth of um, species uh, that are important to the wildlife that live in that wetland. And so it needs to be removed. It's particularly important at this time because it's just starting to get berries. The birds eat the berries and then we have much more buckthorn on the land. So they're out there doing a really good job working on it. And we, we'll, we expect we'll have more and more opportunities like this for people to get involved in the environment. They're working on this particular wetland and you can see the tags. The tags are the trees that we need to save, the maples and the alders and the birch to make that habitable for creatures like this, like this painted turtle. This is the um, entrance to the Deer Run Nature Preserve Trail. Coming up Route 30 you'll come to the covered bridge and if you look directly ahead of you, the view that you see is the Deer Run Nature Preserve. If you keep going up toward Newfane, 
up by the Rock River. You look off to the right and you'll see phase two. You've taken a left at the covered bridge and you're gonna come right out along Camp Arden Road. This is Camp Arden Road. And when you get out this far, uh, you'll see the trailhead on the right. Um, and th these lands here that are in red are being conserved by contiguous landowners um, who really care about conservation and really want their lands to be kept wild in perpetuity. The Deer Na Run Nature Preserve has a little piece of property here so that the trail goes right up through there. It's a lovely section of trail. And then it meanders way, way up, way up to the high point of the land and that's 2.2 miles, 4.4 miles altogether for a, uh, for a nice hike. And um, the reason that it's so crooked is that it was designed by Roger Haydock. Um, and it makes it much easier to walk on because he's, he's um, making it so that no, you don't have to go up any really steep slopes. And what Roger says himself is that he takes it from beauty spot to beauty spot. There is all kinds of things just, when you go on this trail, just keep your eyes open. No matter what, where you are, there's just beauty all around. And so this is what we currently have. This right now is the Deer Run Nature Preserve. Very, very special. Um, and lots of people are hiking on it already. And we welcome you to come and do that. Um, so after we purchased that property last December, we became aware that this huge property, this 626 acre property, which has 2.5 miles of frontage over here on the West River, was going to be sold. It's a, it's a, it's a, a very much a, a, a wilderness piece, and um, we didn't want to see that um, be developed in any way. Um, because we knew it was so important to that wildlife corridor, um, for the watershed that's up here. Um, this, is, this is the top of the Putney Mountain Ridge. This Put the Putney Mountain Ridge comes right down here. And so if you keep going up on up, you'll come to Putney Mountain and you'll come to the mountains that are up further. And this is the side of that uh, end of the ridge, a very, very important piece. The owners very much want to conserve this um, in memory of their parents who own this piece of property. And um, they're working with us on that. And we've gotten a $150,000 grant from the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board uh, to um, purchase that property. Um, and we're working with various foundations and grants, but we need help from people in the community in, in order to do that. We've already been talking to the people who do the West River Trail, and they really want to have a trail that goes all along there. And it's nice and flat because it's just along the river, so we'll see what happens. This is the ridge, um, that I'm, ridge line that I'm going to take you for a walk on. Um, this is in the fall. We're coming into the fall season, so keep your eyes open. It's spectacular, absolutely spectacular in the fall. Millions of years ago, this ridge was high peaks, similar to the Himalayans. So that's millions and millions of years ago. And then as recent as 16,000 years ago, this is glacier. Some people say it was covered with a mile of ice. I think that's kind of hard to believe, but perhaps they're right. Um, and also since, since glacial times, we've had numerous flooding events which have all contributed to the way that this land has been developed. Here we are at the river. It me meanders. As all of you know, sometimes it really rushes. Beautiful, beautiful river. There's um, a variety of species on the river that are in special need of conservation. One of the interesting things about this property is the, the, um, the influence of geology over time. The grasslands are the result of numerous deposits from weather events um, over the eons. Um, but as you walk up, there are these topographic benches uh, where you, you'll notice that um, it, it's kind of a, a bench-like formation in, in the forest. And those are caused um, by the glaciation. And then s some of the rest of it is, is by the uh, continental collisions so millions of years ago. On the riverbank is this Canada lily, an amazing specimen to see. It's very, very beautiful. We're coming into some flat fields now as we walk. This used to be a horse farm across the river. This is great 
place for horseback riding trails. Uh, they still exist there. They're overgrown. But this is the old sign for the horseback riding trails. And people continue to ride their horses there. So you'll be amazed. As you come up the riverbank, you'll see that there's huge fields, much bigger than you generally see in this section of Vermont. You see them up north, but not here. 47 acres of beautiful fields, an absolute haven for pollinators. And what's really exciting is that ornithologists um, have seen bobolinks there. Bobolinks, they're, they're watching them very closely. They're in decline, uh, as is the savannah sparrow. So this is the bobolink. Um, this is the savannah sparrow that we have here. And um, when we were walking out there, we could see them flying in and out. Um, so this is very, very important and very, very beautiful. Um, lands. And the reason that this is a flat land of this nature is because of, of flooding events. Flooding events over time um, make deposits on the, the river bank. And after many, many, you get these, these beautiful fields. Uh, I like to think that this would have been an ideal place for native peoples um, to have settled. In a, and in other areas like this, they've found artifacts and um, perhaps we will too. That's another picture of the field. And then as we make our way up the mountainside, you can see some very old trees. While some of the mountain was logged over time, many portions of it were not. There are some very old trees like this one that's a wonderful living space for all kinds of things like um, uh, porcupines and squirrels and raccoons and hard to say who might live in this one. And then we have some red oak, white pine forests, which are very beautiful to walk through. As, as we go up the side, we'll come into those. Very nice forest. This is another picture of this. This is an area of forest where you'll see that the ground is covered with this sedge-like grass. They're my favorite places for picnics. It's very park-like, where other areas are not so park-like. This is a very park-like kind of area. People vary in what they think is there in terms of deer wintering yard. This is a deer wintering yard and there's probably around 150 acres of deer wintering yard which is very important. It's been recognized uh, by the Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife as a very critical um, deer wintering yard. Uh, it's got lots of hemlock trees and the, the deer hang out underneath it in the winter time um, and it sustains them. As we get closer and closer to the top a really exciting tree is the shagbark hickory. I'm always looking for shagbark hickories in my travels, and there's many, many of them as we get close to the ridge line and on the ridge line. It's a very, very shaggy bark. It's, it's very easy to tell. And there's spaces up under those pieces of uh, bark that hang down. This is a picture here of the northern long-eared bat. And as many of you know, the bats are very much in decline. They like to spend their summers up underneath those uh, big bark flaps on the shag bark hickories. So we want to be sure that those are protected. Once you get to the top, these are the kind of views you see. You see expansive views in all directions, practically, Ab absolutely gorgeous um, the West River Valley to the south and to the north. Here's another view from the top and another view from the top. This is a very, very spectacular piece of property. It's going to be a big deal for us here in Wyndham County to have almost a thousand acre nature preserve. Now I want to introduce you by video to Roger Haydock and he's going to be taking you uh, on a geological walk uh, along the beginning sections of the trail that he made on the phase one parcel. My name is Roger Haydock and we're going to go on a little geology adventure here on the Deer Run Trail. We're going to go back in time 400 plus million years but we'll also take it right up to the present. So let's take a hike. Okay, so you'll notice that that field is nice and smooth. That's because there's no bedrock exposed. And the bottom quarter or so of the Deer Run Trail has no exposed bedrock. Even though the bedrock's down there, 
Why is the bedrock covered over? The bedrock is covered over because glacial deposits were put on top of that bedrock at such a depth, there's no bedrock exposed. What kind of deposit could the glacier have put here that covers over all the bedrock and makes for a smooth surface? Mm -hmm. It's a kind of deposit called a cane. When the glacier was melting back, maybe 16,000 years ago, the last place that melted out was not the highest mountains um, around here, like Stratton. There were a few alpine glaciers in the high white mountains, but not here. Here, the last place the ice melted out was in the valleys because the ice was thicker, because the valleys dropped down deep. So imagine that my arm is the melting glacier. The West River Valley has hills on either side. And as the ice, which is very dirty, having lots of sands, gravels, and boulders in it, melts off, material is accumulating along its edge. Some is resting on the hillsides, some is resting on the solid ice and it forms a pretty flat surface, maybe not perfectly flat. But as that ice eventually melts away, the, these terraces, which are called came terraces, they are no longer being supported by the ice, and so they flop down here, or um, as we're gonna see up above, they can get even steeper. This is material that was left behind at the time when the ice was melting and can cover the bedrock to a considerable depth, which is why there's no bedrock exposed in the first lower quarter of the Deer Run Trail. As you walk through our woods, every once in a while you're going to come on one of these rocks that just looks like it was plopped here. How did it get here? Well, if you go back 200 years ago, the farmers would explain it as caused by Noah's flood. But then geologists began to notice that there had been glaciers that had come down from Canada, and glaciers are what had transported this rock. It's not the local bedrock at all. It's come from somewhere off to the north and west. The frozen ice would transport this material, and when the ice finally melted, it would just drop it wherever the ice happened to be, wherever the stone happened to be. In a big sense, what is Long Island, what is Cape Cod, it's material that was moved southward by the ice and dumped down there. There the deposits are so thick at, that the, they stand above sea level. Here, this is just a more random deposit called a glacial erratic. They're all over this part of Vermont. Behind me is a stream. It's coming down from the higher part of our ridge and it is cutting down through the soft glacially deposited came sediments that were put down here at a time when the ice was melting. These deposits are so thick, they must be 60 feet thick here, and yet the stream has not eroded its way down to bedrock. That's how thick these glacial deposits that were put down when the ice was melting are today, still covering over so much material, there's no bedrock exposed. So here is the stream eroding its way down, and there is the thick deposit that it has cut down through and yet hasn't reached bedrock yet. Here we have a stone wall. Upland Vermont is riddled with stone walls. And how did the stones get here? They were brought here by the glacier. If you look closely, there's different kinds of rock. Here's some quartzite here. If we come in and do a close up here, we can see this is a kind of rock called phyllite. And it's got little garnets in it, okay? This originated as deep ocean mud and was cooked and compressed to where, first of all, mica formed. And then once it was cooked and compressed hot enough, these little bumps, which are called garnets, which are cranberry colored minerals, also came to emerge. So when you look at a stone wall, you're looking at something that um, around here was created by rocks brought by the glacier and then dumped 
when the glacier melted back. There are many different flavors of rock, types of rock, created by the glacier. See, this one has bands in it. This one here does not. They have diverse origins because they came from off to the north and west where the ice collected them before it finally arrived here and dumped them. Here we are maybe somewhere between a quarter and a third of the way up on the trail. And what have we finally hit? Bedrock, <sighs> okay? So down below us, this same rock was covered over by thick deposits from the melting ice of the glacier. But here, those deposits were much thinner. And for the most of the rest of the hike up, the glacial deposits will exist on the ground, but they will be way thinner than they were under the came deposits that we've seen on the lower part of the trail. Those glacial remains of rocks, sands, gravels, clays that are in the upland section are what's called glacial till, T-I-L-L, -L, and that's the standard material that glaciers have dumped on all of our upland environments. The deposits that we find in most of upland Wyndham County that were left by the glacier were not came deposits like we, a very great thickness like we saw in the lower part of the trail. They were thinner deposits, very uneven in thickness, called glacial till. And that characterizes so much of upland Vermont, so much of New England. Just a big mix of stuff dumped. These little holes here were created by garnets, cranberry-colored minerals that used to occupy these little holes, but they've fallen out. And so these pock marks indicate that this formerly had garnet. And when you see garnet, it means the rocks were cooked up to a certain temperature. If you don't see garnet, they weren't cooked up to that temperature. This whole bedrock on the first bottom third of the trail, bottom half of the trail, originated as deep ocean clays, thousands of feet below the surface to where it's always dark, always cold. And these are roughly 400, 430 million years old. we have some more of the variety of types of rock that were brought by the ice. Look at these crystals here, different type of, crystal of rock here, a little bit different, yet another kind of rock. They don't all occur right close, right here, exactly here. They had to be transported here. The ice is what did the job. Here we have some trees that have blown over and they've just been toppled. They show you their root system and they also show you here on this upper part of the trail how close the bedrock was to the surface and that the tree roots didn't have anywhere to go to really anchor themselves very well. And so when the wind blew really hard, the roots of this tree and its neighbors could not hold it because there was no soil that was deep enough for their roots to really anchor them. And so they blew over more easily than they would have if the soils had been thicker. So, if you notice the color of these rocks, they are black, okay? Different than the gray or silver colored rocks we'd seen below. They originated as deep ocean clay. This also 
originated as deep ocean clay. But this was so far down, there was no oxygen in the water. It was anoxic, it was stagnant. It was some kind of stagnant environment. And so this black material is carbon, okay? And if you notice, these rocks, if you can see the, their angle, they're almost vertical. They were laid down originally as sea bottom, flat, like the gray rock we saw below. They were both 430 million years ago, lying flat at the bottom of the deep ocean, off the coast of where South America is today. So where Brazil is today, these were at that time deep, 5,000 feet underwater maybe, where it's perpetually dark, perpetually cold. And they were minding their own business. If we'd been there, we would have had to be in a submarine. And 400 million years ago or so, a land mass came from the east and pushed these ocean sediments up to form domes. So we have a Guilford dome off to our southeast that domed the rocks upward. We had the Athens dome off to our northwest that domed the rocks upward. And we're right in the middle so our rocks didn't dome upwards, they creased downwards. And that's why you see these rocks layered as they are at a vertical angle, right in the middle between these two domes. So you can see these layers are now almost 90 degree vertical. They started out absolutely horizontal or very, very close to it. So they were, they were, com they were compressed originally like this, but then like that. So what you're seeing now is this, they started like that. So okay. we're right on the boundary line between the Athens Dome off to our northwest, the center of which is the oldest rock in the state of Vermont, 1.4 billion years old, and the Guilford Dome off to our southeast, which has two centers, a, a south center in Guilford, but then a northern center at Black Mountain, which you can see dominates the landscape there with that dark shadowy um, double summit. The bedrock of Black Mountain is granite that pushed upwards the rocks that originally had been flat lying on it and then had been folded over even upside down on top of it like the way you would fold a, uh, a bed sheet or something. So these rocks have a bit of complexity of folding. It's the center of the northern part of the Guilford Dome and we here are off at the edge of it. And as we go southeastward from here, the rocks here are close to vertical, but they tilt more and more and more off so that they're dipping northwest, tilting upward southeast, because these rocks used to form a high mountain range that covered that area that's all eroded down. If you look at the summits of these hills and ridges, although they're not exactly the same elevation, they're pretty close to each other. They form a plain, if you filled in the river valleys, they'd form a plain with some undulation. And it's thought by geologists, and the timings are not clear on this, but maybe by 70 million years ago, this landscape had eroded down to where it was pretty close to flat, not perfect. And then within the last 10 or 20 million years, has been uplifted maybe a thousand feet around here. During that time, the rivers, like the West River down below us, have eroded out the valleys, but the hilltops still retain that old original planar surface from uh, perhaps 70 million years ago. We will be encouraging recreation on the Phase 2 parcel as soon as we have purchased it, which we hope will be by the end of this year. We will begin developing trails similar to the trail on Phase 1. To learn more about the Deer Run Nature Preserve and the Green Mountain Conservancy, please do go to greenmountainconservancy.org or send an email to info at greenmountainconservancy.org. Give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. We'd like to hear your impressions of the trail if you get a chance to walk on it. And we'd like to hear if you'd like to help. We need lots of help. And we also are working hard to raise the remainders of the money to buy that important piece of mountain. So um, you can donate through the website um, or you can be in touch with us. You can send the donations in. And, and as soon as we can, we'll be planning more events on the trails.